Look, I'm, I'm sorry, Tom. It's it's my show now. I'm, I'm taking board game breakfast. You're at sea. What are you going to do? The contributors are on my side. Hey, look, look. You cruise, you lose. In this case, you lose your show. All right, welcome to Board Game Breakfast. And as you can see, Tom's not here. Him and the gang are on the Dice Tower cruise, so I've decided to stage a little coup while they're on the cruise. So now we're going to call it Board Game Breakfast with me, or with Robert. I'm not really sure what we're going to call it yet. For right now, let's just stick with Board Game Breakfast. And let's go ahead and get started with the news. There's your news. I actually do have a few things this week. First off, Asmodee has announced the acquisition of a publisher called Bezer Wizard Nordic. Now, this is a smaller publisher you may not have heard of before. They published a game called Hint, and they published a game called Bezer Wizard. Bezer Wizard being a trivia game that our own Eric Summerer is a huge fan of. Now, as to what they plan on doing in the future with this publisher, we'll see. I'm hoping maybe we'll see an English release of Hint and maybe a new edition of Bezer Wizard. In addition, Renegade Games has announced a solo game coming out called Proving Grounds. This is listed as a story-driven dice game. It's designed by Kane Klenko, who also designed Fuse and Flatline, two of my personal favorite games. It looks like it'll also incorporate some real-time elements, much like his other games, and that is due out in April of this year. Stronghold Games has announced five new games and expansions. The first one probably being the biggest note of it, and that is Gonshawn Clever, the U.S. English version. And for those not familiar, it's a roll and write game from 2018 that was also a nominee for the Kenner Spiel Award. It's also a very popular app with people actually trying to get low scores and high scores. I myself mostly on the low end, uh, but it looks like the English version of that is going to be called That's Pretty Clever. So that's pretty exciting news. In addition, they've announced a second edition of the loved Vital Lacerda game, CO2. This is going to be have some updated rules, an updated rule book, and looks like some updated wooden components as well. So probably a lot of Vital fans out there excited about that news. They've also announced a game called Astro Drive, which is a fast-paced, car-driven spaceship racing game. It's about all I know on that one. They've also announced an expansion for Space Freaks called Violent Morass, and then an expansion for a game called Flam Rouge that most people have are pretty familiar with. I know our own Dave Luza is actually a huge fan of that game. And it looks like it's going to be called Mateo and is going to add some wind and weather management. So I'm actually excited to see how that will change up that game. Next up, Fantasy Flight made a splash this week by announcing the Lord of the Rings Journey to Middle Earth, an app-driven cooperative game that looks like, from what I've seen, it's going to be sort of in that Descent 2nd Edition, Imperial Assault sort of feeling to it. I looked at the miniatures, those looked really cool, but I know a lot of people are just going to be excited to have something in the Lord of the Rings in that sort of story-driven mode. It looks like each thing will be a part of an overarching campaign, much the way Descent runs. So that's pretty exciting news there. It is listed as pre-order for right now, and it is going to be coming out in the second quarter of this year. And then lastly, Snakes and Latte, the board game cafe, has made an announcement for some more U.S. locations. One of them affecting me personally in that it's going to be here in Orlando, Florida, where I'm based. But they also announced a second location will be opening in Arizona. They updated some of the locations they had previously announced and also made note that they were in the talks phase for potentially 17 other U.S. cities. So it looks like no matter where you are in the U.S., there's about to be soon a Snakes and Latte near you. So that's pretty exciting news. Well, that looks like all I've got for news. So let's do as we always do and move to Kickstarter news. Hello, 
fellow gamers? This week's Kickstarters blew up. I actually don't have enough time to talk about all of the cool ones that I saw here. So I'm going to have to maybe save some of those for next week, but I did choose the best of the best for this week, so let's get started. Featured this week, we have Suro Phoenix Rising by Calliope Games. This is for two to eight mystical phoenixes who want to do whatever the heck they please. As players get to flip, rotate, and add tiles to the board, all while trying to transform mystical lanterns into seven stars for about 20 to 60 minutes. A standard pledge for this game is $40, and don't worry, one resurrection per flaming bird is also included in the set. Speaking of things resurrected... This next one is Pulling from the Past with War of the Worlds by Gray Fox Games, which is obviously an asymmetrical game for one ruthless human and one cranky alien. As two of you battle it out, building decks and either annihilating all humans from the map or doing 30 damage as a valiant effort to hold them off for about 30 to 60 minutes so they get the sniffles and eventually perish. A copy of this Warforged game will cost you $39, and there's even an expansion available that adds another map. Now, if that's not creepy enough for you, then perhaps you can play AV Ghost Paranormal Investigation by Mystical Games in the Dark with one to four of your friends who can't run faster than you as you'll be researching cases, setting down equipment, and then waiting until midnight to wander around a creepy house, using light filters to search for clues and items to solve a case for about 90 to 180 minutes. Now this game comes with six cases and a really cool app that narrates the event, all for a pledge of $98. Next up is a little Euro called La Stanza by Quinn Games. This is for two to four art collectors looking to collect paintings that allow you to take specific actions. The caveat being that you'll need to wander around the mansion using them in specific rooms for about 60 to 90 minutes. This work of art costs $52, although the deluxe edition is a Kickstarter release only, guys. Lastly, we have Circadian's First Light by Garp Hill Games, which is for one to four space explorers looking to negotiate, trade, harvest, and of course, build the best space base of the universe as you roll dice and then you place them to create a working engine that suits you and your station for 60 to 90 minutes. Getting started on this adventure will cost you $53 and surprisingly, no degree is required. Now for expansions and reprints and whatever. Western Legends has a new expansion called Ante Up that includes eight characters, items, and story cards, along with new ways to gamble, a territory board, and the ability to rob or ride a locomotive for about $38. They also have some really cool optional buys like stores and a playmat. Also, the cooperative game Onimaru has relaunched with much greater success, so if you're looking to fight some demons with friends, that'll be $59. Finally, if you're looking for some sweet, sweet promo love, then Board Game Spotlight and Board Game Exposure have put together Promo Paradise. Starting at $19, which features games like Sagrada, Everdale, Architects of the West Kingdoms, Lords of Hella, Western Legends, and more. Thank you so much for joining us this week, guys. If you enjoyed any of the Kickstarters that you saw here today, make sure to join us on Wednesday this week as we will be at PAX South on Friday. And you can go to gloryhound.com to check that out and join in on the conversation because we really love interacting with you guys. Other than that, we will see you guys all next week. If you like board game promo items like me, you are in for a treat. I found Promo Paradise currently on Kickstarter at the time of filming until around end of January 2019. I'll tell you what it is about quickly and what I think about it coming up. Hi everyone, it's Stella from Maple University. If you don't know us yet, our mission is to explain board game rules clearly on YouTube. We do rules of a few playthrough and review video just like this one. So what is promo cards or components? They're usually additional contents to the existing board games. They're adding flavor and varieties to the gameplay of existing board games. I personally like them because I have the FOMO or fear of missing out. So I don't want to miss out on uh, these special cards that may add variety to the gameplay. They also usually come from special events and usually exclusive to that particular event. So basically, if they're gone, then you'll miss out. 
So you may or may not know this popular Facebook board game groups, the Board Game Spotlight and Board Game Exposure, launch their product on Kickstarter called Promo Paradise. They have a lot of varieties of the games, uh, different rewards for depending what sort of cards you want from what set of board games. So for your information, I don't get paid to talk about Promo Paradise. I just really love what they're doing in the board game community and promo cards. So let's check it out what promo cards and what games are available on Promo Paradise. So they have four different ways to collect the promo cards. Although one of them is already sold out, which is pick any three promos, but you can see a lot of games Popular games are included in this Promo Paradise. If you're interested in backing it up, please search Promo Paradise on Kickstarter. And if you have been enjoying my content, please consider checking us out on YouTube. Until next week. All right, so what do we have coming this week from the Dice Tower? Well, with Tom and the gang at sea, there won't be a live Q&A today, but we still have plenty of great reviews for you. Sam's got a couple more in his top series coming out and plenty of great content from other contributors. Let's keep moving. Now today we're gonna to play a game of cards. Now you're gonna say, what do cards have to do with war games? Down in Flames Aces High is a game designed by Dan Verson, published by Dan Verson Games, DVG, and is a game of aerial tactical combat with cards. Down in Flames Aces High is a medium to low complexity game and the rule book is 22 pages long. Relax, take it easy. This is what the rule book looks like. Plus there's examples of play, a setup, optional rules, credits, lots of pictures too. You will choose and fly planes from Germany, Poland, Russia, Japan, United States, and the United Kingdom. So you choose two planes built in the same year, you secretly choose an altitude which you will fly at. If you're at the same altitude, a dogfight happens. It just occurred to me, why do they call it a dogfight? What's dog about a plane? If this happens, you play cards that help you give you an advantage over your opponent in terms of positioning or altitude or shots fired. Each card offers you different possibilities. So you play a barrel roll card. What can you do? You can maneuver, it changes position, and you also react defensively by your opponent playing a card such as barrel roll, maneuvering, in my sights, and scissors, negating his aggressive actions. Plus in the rule book, every card is detailed in a short little paragraph. These action cards are the heart of the game. This is what drives this game. The planes that you're gonna fly have different information. The year that they are available, how many hits they can take, how many cards you can draw before, after, and how many cards you can have in your hands at one time. If the plane is hit, the performance suffers, the card is turned over, the hits are carried over to the maximum number of hits that plane can take. What's also great about this game is that you have campaigns, not just dogfights, so you have a goal of what to do. You prepare your planes, you carry out that goal, and dogfights arise. And if you don't have enough planes and or cards, there's an expansion to this called Down in Flames Wingman. And if that still isn't enough, you can get the sister game called Down in Flames World War II Guns Blazing with more planes, more bombers, and more missions. And you might say, Dan, nah, I'm not into World War II. That's okay, he's got the modern take on this game. DVG's Down in Flames Ace is High, two to six player game, plays in 30 minutes, lots of fun. Thank you for watching. And if you want to know more about war games, please check out my site, No Enemies Here. Hey folks, this is Jonathan for Harsh Opinion and today's going to be my top 5 games of 2018. So bear with me, here we go. My number 5 is Carpidium. You know, Stefan Fell is one of my, it's my best designers of all time. I never, I didn't play the From Trajanam yet, so that's why it's not going to show up on my list for it. But this one is an amazing game. The only problem with that game is the look, it's really ugly. I don't even know why they decide to go with that look, but it's an amazing game. You're gonna build your own uh, little tableau of tiles and trying to connect buildings with one uh, with one another and have points in different ways like Stefan Fell likes to do them. So this is my number five. Number four is Rise of Queensdale. This is, in my own opinion, uh, one of the best uh, legacy Euro game out there. Uh, the story is really, uh, really involving. The only problem I get with the game is the fact that if you start playing the game with three players, then you're stuck doing the whole campaign with three players. But except for that, it's a uh, worker placement games with dice and everything, and you get a 
you get um, a sense of discovery each time. So that's my number four. My number three, it's Teotihuacan. This is the sequel sort of, of Tolkien by the, by, by the same designer. Uh, and it's like a roundel game, but there's so much ways to uh, set up the game differently each time that makes the game uh, replay value on the higher end of the list. It's an amazing game. You're gonna do a bunch of actions and the production value on that game for the price, it's pretty neat. My, num my number two, it's Quimbra. Quimbra was released um, uh, at Gen Con this uh, last summer, and this game it's a, it's a worker it's not a worker placement. You're gonna you're gonna uh, a dice drafting game. You're gonna roll dice of different colors, and you're gonna draft them for the numbers on the dice, but also for the colors because the dice is gonna get you cards. Um, the higher the number, the the sooner you're gonna get the cards, but you're gonna pay more. And after that, you're gonna have bonus depending on the color on the dice. Amazing game, but I have to say that my number one game of the of the year 2018 it's Guyan. I, I I don't know if I pronounce it well, but anyways, Guyan. Uh, this is the Kickstarter edition. So uh, if you see them uh, on store, it's not gonna have the same cover. It's a worker placement game with cards. Uh, that you have to have a higher number of cards if you want to do the, the main action without any penalty uh, and there's a lot of things that I really like inside the game uh, different ways to uh, score points and everything so this is by far my number one of the game and if I have an one honorable mention would have been in my number six Architects of the West Kingdom I really hope that the sequel to that, Paladins of the West, of the West Kingdom, that's going to come out this year, is going to be as much fun as this one. So thank you for watching. See you next time, guys. Bye-bye. All right, so no Tom Thinks segment this week because right now what Tom thinks is that's a robust buffet on the cruise ship. Can't say that I blame him. I'm a little jealous. I was on the cruise the last couple of years, and I kind of missed that buffet. But I figured I would actually give some thoughts because this is the first time I've ever hosted Board Game Breakfast, and it's actually the first time I've ever hosted one of these shows in general. Now, I've done Contributor for crowd surfing, and I think I did one segment once on Board Game Breakfast. And let me tell you, this is harder than it looks. The new segment alone probably took me three or four tries because I just kept messing up. So while this isn't really about board games, this is really a think piece about content because I do make board game content. I make reviews, I make how to plays. So what I'm curious about this week is what's your favorite kind of board game content? Do you prefer watching reviews? Do you prefer watching how to plays? Have you ever thought about making content yourself? Because honestly, this is a lot of work and as much as I enjoy it, some days there are times that I feel like, why am I doing this? But I do enjoy it and I hope that you're enjoying it as well. So that's my thinks this week and that I'm just, I'm curious what everyone thinks about content in general. Do you think there's too much of it? Do you think there's not enough of it? Let us know down in the comments. I know all the contributors also, they make plenty of great content and they're, they're kind of probably curious as to what you think as well. So with that said, let's move on. Chris Renshaw here, and I'm curious, what do you keep your dice in? Especially if you have to travel to play a game, whether it be a game store or your friend's house, a convention, whatever, we have to have something to carry our dice in. If you've got some disposable cash, here are a couple of things you can get that can upgrade instead of just, you know, carrying around in a Tupperware bowl or something. The most common thing that people use are your, your classic dice bag. And these come in all sorts of sizes. I mean, this is like your average size and this is nothing fancy, whatever. Or you've even got tinier if you just have one set of dice. Who has only one set of dice though? Like I'm using these for fate coins right now. But then you can also get like crazy creative. Like I've got one for, uh, I like the PVP comic and I've got like my uh, sp some special dice for a specific game in there. Or you do the whole kit and caboodle if you're like me and have a crap ton of dice, then you get something like this, this is from Easy Roller Dice where they you can fit 
a whole lot of dice. And I like this one because I can see inside and pull out something specific that I'm looking for. And like some of these other ones, we have to almost like empty out the whole thing. But what if a bag just isn't your bag? Well, a lot of companies make these nice custom wooden components to store your dice in, such as Wormwood and Dongbite Games. So if you've got a little bit extra cash to throw around, these are definitely more expensive than just getting a dice bag. You might want to take a look at these. And these come in all sorts of sizes. I've got like a little D&D one here from Wormwood that's just got, you know, it's actually my first set of dice in here. And I just have that if I need dice in emergency kind of thing. No one, no one needs dice in emergency. And then there's this. This is actually what I end up carrying to, this is what I use to carry my dice in it, mainly because uh, this is from Dogmite. I roll a rogue with a lot of D6s and it allows me to carry a lot of D6s in it, unlike some of the other ones. And it snaps closed, it keeps itself, it's nice and sturdy, I can throw it around. If I had a miniature, it would fit in here as well. So that's this is what my preference is. It's easy also to slide in a bag. But I'm curious, what do you all use? Do you prefer the bags or do you prefer the dice fault things? Let me know down in the comments below and let me know if there's other things I've missed that I need to check out for myself because I love dice accessories, as you can see by the amount of dice I have. So in the meantime, make sure you also follow me on all the different social media platforms. Check out my channel, OCD, for also other great RPG stuff. And until next time, may all your hits be crits. Happy breakfast, everybody. Today, I'm gonna to talk to you about Shadows in Kyoto. Now, it's got the same geishas from Hanamakoji, but it's in a very different atmosphere. The game kind of mixes the sort of strategy of Stratego, where you are bluffing and you don't know what your opponents are moving, with some of the sort of special moves of Onitama, um, sort of on a very small grid. It plays super quickly. Now, your actual turn, you're playing a card moving. That's it. There's some special movement. There might be sort of a capture potentially involved, but otherwise turns can be like five seconds apiece. Now, if you know what you're doing, the game maybe slows down a bit. Uh, and I've seen sort of some games go really quick and some games sort of drag out as you're really trying to work out that strategy. Now, the theming of the game is a little bit meh. It's got the geishas from Hanamakoji, which are, again, drawn really nicely, and the artwork of those cards looks really nice. And the very old player powers that they come with are, yeah, they're decent. They will certainly allow the game to have some longevity. The theming is that there's sort of an issue going on between the government and the Onua ban, and they are trying to get intel past each other, and uh, something like that. It's it, That's the reasoning of why one of your people is maybe trying to sneak behind them or you're trying to find their intel. It works enough to, to do what is a very small game. For me, it doesn't replace um, Onitama, but it, it almost certainly does replace Stratego um, because it's the same feeling of, I've got these pieces, I'm trying to hide these, but take that from you. Uh, but in like 10 minutes max rather than like 40 minutes. So very much an improvement there. That's Shadows in Kyoto. And I'm Oliver East, signing out. Hi, Mike Delicio from Solo Mode Games. Recently on my podcast, Sporadically Bored with Mike and Dan, we tackled the topic of oversaturation. We were wondering if perhaps too many games are getting released into the market, and if so, is this a negative thing for the hobby? Is it getting too difficult for the consumer of either board, ga board game content or actual board games as a product? Is it getting too difficult to keep up with it, and is it getting too hard to be a potentially critical consumer of that content or games? And as we were having this conversation, it kind of came to me something that I feel is going on, and I don't know if this is true or not, but it seems that more and more there's an expectation that games will not necessarily get reprinted. That maybe you'll have an initial print run and that's it. Unless it's a very high profile game, you pretty much assume that you're gonna have one print run of a game and then it's done. 
And if that's the case, which it does seem to me that it's the case more and more, perhaps we are getting oversaturated. To me, that's one sign of oversaturation, is if there's this assumption that a one-and-done situation is going to happen with games. So I really wanted to get the Dice Tower listeners' opinion on this. Do you feel that more and more there's a, an initial print run of games and then there's no reprint? And if you do feel that way, is that a sign of oversaturation? Or do you feel like the hobby is doing just fine? The more games, the merrier. Keep them coming. Bring them on. If you can let me know your thoughts in the comments below, I'd really like to hear it. Thank you so much for your time, as always, and have a great day. Turn. Hey, board game friends. I'm Alan. I'm Randy. Board game friends. It's different. It's new. <laughs> yeah, I'm bored. Um, okay, so usually I like to present the game from behind us and be like, hey, this is what we're playing. But um, it's too big to do that. So it's big. I'm just going to have long. it here. Yeah. It's wide. It's deep. All those things. <laughs> Um, I can't say enough good things about this game. I love it so much. It is worker place from heaven. It's really, really good. I was warned that it is like over the top and too many choices, but I totally disagree. It is so magnificently fun. Yeah, there's a lot of spaces. There's no question. It's a heavy game. Sure. There's a lot of sp <laughs> spots to go. It takes you at least a half a game, maybe a whole game, a whole game to get me. used to it. Uh, but then you quickly find out that having all those spaces is fantastic for mm -hmm. this game. Uh, because they fill up fairly quickly, yeah, especially the ones that you want in a two or three player game, places that are getting taken left and right, mm -hmm. and you're you're thinking you're you're thinking Uve <laughs> that uh, uh, there's all those spaces to go to. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that there's like okay, well I don't love this part. There's a Tetris building aspect which I normally I'm not good at, I like so I don't lot. love it. He he's got the brain for it. I don't. Um, but as you you can build your board at your leisure. So you can kind of put the pieces aside and strategically place them when you feel ready to. Yeah. You can surround bonus uh, squares and obtain those per round. It's just such a well thought out, it's fantastic really well game. Done. I love it. Actually, we loved it so much. We played it the very next day, which for me is huge. Especially on a heavy game like this yeah. for you. I yeah. don't typically like volunteer to go this heavy, but I was like, we going to do this. And guess what, y'all? I won. By, was, by a point. By a That's point. all right. By a I can lose. I know yeah. how to lose sometimes. Sometimes he does. <laughs> um, and then my favorite thing ever about this game are the tiny little precious coins. They're cute. They're so cute. <laughs> and the picture of the day. And we're on Twitter, Instagram, and... Twitter, I think. Did you say that? I said Twitter. Just said and then it. Twitch. Yeah. Oh, uh, we live streamed a couple of shows. Uh, first one had some audio issues. Second one, we had some guests. <laughs> you guys And we had <laughs> screaming babies. But we promise we won't have any more screaming babies. At least not that much. Mm, I can't promise that. All right. Have a good week, guys. Bye. Bye. Hello. My name's Dan. This is Cora. And we're here today to talk to you about board games for children. Well, young children, really. But we're, we're hiding at the moment because we've heard that Tom isn't doing this episode today. It's a man called Robert. And that's fine. But his last name is Ghost Liquor. And we're quite scared of ghosts, aren't we? <laughs> and we don't want the Ghost Liquor to come and get us. So we need to do a game that's very small so we can play it while hiding under the table. So today, we're playing this game. What is it, Cora? Cupid. What? Cubies. Shh! He'll hear us! Cubies is a puzzle speed game where the players are racing to make a face out of a set of three wooden cubes. One player turns over a card and then everyone simultaneously tries to make the face on the card. This can actually be a bit harder than it might first seem as there's a surprisingly large number of different ways in which the cubes fit together. So Cora, what, what do you think of Cubies? It's very hard. Yeah. Because, like, uh, some there's like two blocks joined together, and you don't know which side. And sometimes it's standing up like that. Yeah, it is very hard. It, it requires quite a lot of spatial awareness, doesn't it? it? It requires quite a lot of knowing where how to put things together and 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 working out 
it's quite a puzzly game, really. To win this, you probably need to do jigsaws a lot. To win this, you probably need to do jigsaws a lot. That's, a, that's quite insightful. It's also a race game. It's a, it, a lot of kids' games are puzzle games. Are just puzzles where you race to be the first to complete a puzzle. And that's not my favourite type of kids' game, to be honest. Because usually the adult is going to win that. And so we just use them as puzzles, don't we? Yeah. Yeah. QB's is fun. It's nice making the faces out of uh, out of the cubes, isn't it? Yes. Um, but it's okay. It's okay. So we give QB's two. Trying to put cubes together, thumbs up or something like that. I don't know. Now, no one tell Mr. Ghost Licker where we are. I think he's coming! Ah! All right, so that's gonna wrap up this week's board game breakfast. I wanna thank all the contributors for sticking with me this week for the coup. Dan, uh, I'm coming for you. Don't worry about that. Uh, keep an eye out next week. Tom and the gang will be back. We also have the Dice Tower Kickstarter launching next week on Tuesday. Tom will talk about that on his board game breakfast segment next week. But, you know, keep that in mind. It's, again, as Thomas said before, this is free content we give to you. And if you think that's worth your time, if you think that's worth your money, and you still get some great rewards out of it, go check out the Kickstarter when it launches next week. I hope you enjoy the rest of your week, and take care. Yeah. No, the show went great, Tom. Yep. See? You weren't even needed. Nope. Nobody missed you. Yeah. I know. I, mi I miss the cruise, too. All right. Yeah. Oh, I have to turn the camera off. I, I don't actually know where the off button is. Yeah, I'm just going to I'm just going to let it run. Uh, you can just turn it off when you get back. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production, sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at coolstuffinc.com.